I'm going to uh, discuss today um, the literature and evidence regarding the use of perioperative radiosurgery in the treatment of brain metastases, something that we see commonly um, as surgeons, but I wanted to go through the, the data in support of this practice. And so this group will know, but brain metastases are the most common intracranial malignancy. These are identified in 20 to 40% of cancer patients uh, at some course during their disease. And the incidence is rising, and that's because the immunotherapies and targeted systemic therapies are really uh, providing significant control neck down, but those uh, treatments still fail to have effective penetration across the blood-brain barrier. And so patients are living longer, thus they have a significantly increased at-risk period. And during that period, um, the, the availability or ability to develop brain metastases exists. And so Incidence is rising, and, and we expect that to continue to increase over time. Treatment options for brain metastases are uh, a combination of surgical resection and radiation primarily. So traditionally, surgical resection has been reserved for solitary lesions, large lesions uh, that are symptomatic. And this definition of large is a moving target. Traditionally, it was greater than 2.5 centimeters based on the limitations of uh, prior radiosurgery devices, but, but this has been pushed in recent years to you know, upwards of three and a half, four centimeters, or lesions with significant associated vasogenic edema. And although um, radiation might uh, eventually take care of that, the amount of time required uh, to, to significantly reduce the vasogenic edema post-radiation is much longer than post-surgery. So if you have, for example, the patient with uh, newly diagnosed cancer, a large uh, brain metastasis with uh, significant edema, and the oncologist wants to get them on immunotherapy, then they will want you to do everything possible to get them off steroids quickly, and so surgery might be the answer there. Uh, in addition to surgical resection, radiation uh, therapy has really been the backbone of treatment of brain metastases for decades, and previously the uh, modality of choice was whole brain radiotherapy. This was sort of phasing out at the beginning of my residency, so 15, 20 years ago. Um, and there has been an increasing move towards stereopathic radiosurgery as the first line treatment. We'll go through the risks and uh, pros and cons of both approaches. And then, as I said, chemotherapy and immunotherapy, although there are some uh, newer agents that do have some blood brain barrier penetration in general, this is poor. And so, surgery and radiation uh, end up being our main. Um, modalities and, and of the radiation therapy, stereotactic radiation. So the, the role of radiosurgery in treatment of brain metastases can be divided into three groups. Uh, one is definitive radiosurgery. So this is radiosurgery for an intact lesion that never gets surgery uh, in whom uh, radiation is the, radiosurgery is the one and only treatment uh, given. Uh, this involves uh, primarily uh, the radiation oncologists, although obviously uh, the surgeons are involved in planning and, and frame application if necessary, but, but most of these patients who just get definitive radiosurgery will come from oncology to radiation oncology, and then the surgeon will be added on uh, after that. In contrast, um, there are lesions, these big solitary lesions or ones associated with a lot of edema, um, that require a combination of surgery and radiosurgery. And historically, this has been post-operative radiosurgery, uh, but, but in the more modern era, last several years, there's been a move towards neoadjuvant or preoperative radiosurgery also. And so post-operative and preoperative radiosurgery are where our worlds uh, really intersect in the treatment of uh, brain metastases patients. And so we'll focus on that. So when I was in training, it was, um, and, and even when I first started on faculty here, uh, the use of post-operative SRS after surgical resection of a brain metastasis was still uh, a bit um, dealer's choice. And so some people did it and some people didn't, but there wasn't great um, evidence-based uh, guidance in support of or against that practice. And so, uh, so again, it was uh, a dealer's choice kind of deal. That existed until 2017, and these two uh, very important papers were published in the same uh, edition of Lancet Oncology, one from the MD Anderson Group and one from a multi-institutional consortium, but led by Paul Brown out of Canada. And so this was um, level one evidence uh, in support of postoperative SRS. And so the two trials were 
The MD Anderson trial was postoperative radio surgery versus observation for gross totally resected brain metastases, and this was single center. And then the uh, group out of Toronto did postoperative SRS uh, in contrast to whole brain radiation therapy, so a more traditional approach uh, for resected brain metastases. This was a multi center trial. We'll start with MD Anderson group. In total, out of the 196 patients that they screened, they ultimately enrolled 128 half of which were allocated to observation, half of which allocated to the SRS group. And this is a busy slide with their um, Kaplan-Meier data, but the, the take-home point here is that uh, in this top uh, left Kaplan-Meier graph, uh, those patients who had observation denoted in the blue line had much uh, inferior local control compared to those who had uh, postoperative SRS. That being said, even if you had postoperative SRS for a gross totally resected brain metastasis at uh, two years, your local control was around 60%. At one year, your local control was around 70, 75%. So not amazing, but certainly better than uh, observation alone. So these are gross totally resected brain meds. You feel happy about the post-op scan. And at 12 months, uh, well over 50% will have recurred locally. And so this provided evidence that post-op SRS was beneficial in this patient population for local control. Not surprisingly, it didn't impact overall survival because it's rare that a uh, solitary brain metastasis or, or a single focus of intracranial disease is the driver towards a patient's mortality for uh, systemic uh, cancer. It's usually lung, liver, bone disease, et cetera, visceral disease. And then, um, not surprisingly, between the observation and SRS groups, there was no significant difference in uh, distant brain recurrences. And this makes sense because this isn't like whole brain where you would be giving radiation uh, to uh, parenchyma that was at a uh, distance from your uh, target site. And then uh, this is a very important graph that helps us to understand where the future of this uh, kind of treatment is going. So the freedom from local recurrence, this is the entire cohort, SRS and observation, but the freedom from local recurrence was directly related to lesion size. So for those lesions that were less than 2.5 centimeters, they did very well, um, uh, particularly with the SRS treatment. But for those lesions that were greater than two and a half or greater than three and a half centimeters, their freedom from local control, even with the addition of SRS, was not great. And so um, there needs to be something to better address this group. And so that, that represents an area of future work. Um, the other trial out of Paul Brown's group was postoperative SRS, again, compared with whole brain radiation therapy. So in the old days, or not that long ago, uh, a patient would get a brain metastasis resected, and then they would get whole brain, and that was standard treatment. And, um, and there was this observation and data that showed that those patients really suffered from a neurocognitive standpoint. And so this paper aimed to understand uh, if that was true and what the comparison was to more focal uh, stereotactic beta surgery to the cavity. And so this is the most important uh, figure from their manuscript. And this looked at cognitive deterioration-free survival. Uh, so neurocognitive outcomes from whole brain versus SRS. And you can see that the SRS cohort did better. It's not that they did amazingly better, but they clearly did better, and the curves separate over time. And I'm not showing this data, but it's in the in their 122-page supplement. But they did show that whole brain radiation therapy had a little bit better local control than SRS. And this is likely because whole brain radiation, uh, with its fractionated schema, works better for those large lesions over two and a half, three and a half centimeters than SRS, and so. Although for small lesions, the strategies um, tend to result in similar local control for larger lesions, this fractionated schema that whole brain radiation therapy has seems better. And again, so keep that point in mind with that size data from the Mahajan paper, and then we'll talk, circle back to that at the end. Um, I should say that overall survival was no different between these two cohorts. And so on the basis of these two uh, manuscripts that were, that were published now uh, four and a half, almost five years ago, Postoperative SRS to the resection cavity has become standard practice, and nobody does whole brain anymore. And here's a good case example with a solitary cerebellar met, uh, had lung cancer and no evidence of active systemic disease. She had that lesion resected. And then she had postoperative uh, SRS to the resection cavity. And so this was her gaminized plan. You can see that she was treated in a frame. You can see the little fiducial markers on her MRI uh, from the frame in the modern era with frameless radiosurgery on the icon, we would treat this in a mask, and she got 14 gray 
um, at the 50% isodose line, that uh, prescription is based on the volume of the resection cavity um, greater than uh, 14 cc's gets a different dose than uh, 10 to 14 cc's and less than 10 cc's. And so, and this um, kind of prescription data is available in that and the Anderson paper. For those of you who will ultimately take the Gaminite course, we'll go into this kind of stuff in detail. Um, and, and I want to make a quick note about how this kind of uh, radiosurgery gets planned. And so um, prior to the most recent gamma knife uh, upgrade, you would take a lesion like this and manually place uh, most of the shots and then the computer would do some finessing for you. But most of this was done by the user, either the radiation oncologist or the neurosurgeon, something called forward planning. And you can get a pretty good plan, 98% coverage and 81% selectivity, a good gradient index and a reasonable treatment time of 37 minutes, but this might take you five to 10 minutes to put this plan together. There's in the new software uh, called Lightning, you can just identify what you want your target to be, and then you put the parameters into the software and it will inverse plan it for you. And so in about 10 seconds, it will give you a very conformal and nice plan. That certainly cuts down the thinking time for, for the practitioner and you get good coverage, 99%, 90% selectivity, excellent gradient index. Now, this treatment was long, but to this plan that Lightning came up with took 63 minutes. And so you might say, well, that's a long time for the patient to lay there on, in the machine with a mask on. But the beauty of Lightning is that you can just uh, go back to uh, this screen and tell the, tell the computer to place more emphasis on beam on time so that it uh, sort of makes the treatment more efficient. And then with another click of the button and another 10 seconds of computer work, uh, you can bring your beam on time or treatment down, down by half with pretty uh, excellent coverage and selectivity and gradient index. And so uh, those of you who take the Gamma Knife course or will come down for Gamma Knife planning in your own practice know that um, this software has really uh, changed the efficiency of, of gamma knife. And then this is that same patient scan many years later, having done well. So postoperative SRS conclusions, local control with postoperative SRS is superior to observation. Neurocognitive outcomes with postoperative SRS are superior to whole brain. And these two statements provide uh, the evidence that's used to support this practice. Local control rates are size dependent, particularly with single fraction approaches. And so because of that um, data and the supplementary data from that whole brain paper and the two and a half to two and a half and three and a half and greater than three and a half centimeter size data from the Anderson paper, because of those uh, pieces of data, there is now an ongoing clinical trial evaluating single fraction versus hypofractionated post-op SRS. And the thought is that for these higher risk lesions, greater than two and a half, certainly greater than three and a half centimeters, hypofractionated post-op SRS is going to give us better control, uh, something more similar to the whole brain radiation data, but without the neurocognitive penalty. And, and as I showed you, this new gamma plan software called Lightning uh, makes treatment planning much more efficient. That's post-operative SRS. There's a more evolving, uh, newer paradigm of preoperative SRS or neoadjuvant SRS, and there's been uh, a significant increase in the literature for this strategy in the last five years to which uh, our group has contributed. And so the idea is, you know, we can take out a brain metastasis, we can have a post-op scan that looks pretty uh, good that we're all happy with, but the biggest issue uh, with um, surgical resection of brain metastases is the propensity to um, cause leptomeningeal disease. And that's because many of the lesions that we ultimately take to surgery are so big that they're not amenable to on-block resection and piecemeal resection absolutely increases your risk of leptomeningeal disease. And so the patient may look great on post-op day one, their scan may look great, but six months later, eight months later, 10 months later, they develop carcinomatous meningitis and that is uniformly fatal. And so there's been this uh, move towards thinking about how we might decrease that spread. And one thought is that if we give these lesions that we know need surgery, neoadjuvant SRS, in theory, we've developed, delivered a lethal dose of radiation to every one of those cells so that if they are disturbed at time of surgery and the lesion does not come out on block, if that tumor cell migrates away from the surgical site, hopefully 
and has received a lethal dose of radiation and thus decreases its risk and ability to seed the subarachnoid space. In addition, uh, you could see that post-op resection cavity from that cerebellar mat, it starts to get a little funny and complicated a couple of weeks post-op when the patient presents for radiosurgery. So it's much easier to define the lesion uh, for radiosurgery and draw the target um, before you have a, a shaggy resection cavity a couple of weeks out. And so there's been many papers, as I said, that are now um, looking retrospectively at this data. And there are now uh, is a prospective trial looking at pre-op versus post-op SRS. And this is an example of how this might look. This is a gamma knife plan for a patient with a renal cell carcinoma metastasis that was very symptomatic and rapidly evolving. And so it's very easy to make a plan for something like this, um, both the forward and inverse lightning planning. Uh, you don't have to think really hard about the margins of the lesion and if that's postoperative change or actual tumor. Uh, we know everything here is tumor. And so this patient got radiosurgery and then had their uh, lesion resected within 24 hours. And this is pseudosymmetry. And then lastly, I'll just mention this paper mostly for the uh, residents in the group. The um, imaging changes after radiosurgery to brain metastases can uh, vary widely. And as we do more and more radiosurgery, because there's more brain metastases and patients are living longer and no one's really doing whole brain anymore, we see a lot of funny uh, imaging changes and it's not always um, clear what's going on. And so this is a paper that, that I wrote as a resident 10 years ago that was in AJNR. And I looked at approximately 500 brain metastases that had been treated with radiosurgery. And basically lesions will fall into one of three groups. So you can have a small lesion um, like a group A lesion, you treat that with radiosurgery, you don't think much of it, that's clearly going to respond well, and it does for three, six months, and then one day it sort of explodes. And this obviously uh, is troublesome to the patient and to the physician. Most of the time, something that's this explosive, especially with a small target at the beginning, is radiation necrosis, as opposed to uh, local failure tumor, uh, tumor recurrence. And you can see, you know, the smallest collimator on the gamma knife is four millimeters, and this lesion is smaller than that. And so there's going to be a uh, not insignificant volume of normal brain that gets radiosurgery. And so these kinds of lesions are at high risk for developing radiation necrosis later. Then you can have these group B lesions that are sort of medium sized. They get smaller, everybody's happy, and then they get bigger, and everyone's a little worried. This is in the paracentral lobule. Maybe the patient's a little symptomatic, there's some edema, and then eventually they regress with steroids in time. And this group B lesions actually were the patients that survived the longest in our in this study. And this, this in, in intermediate time point likely represents a period of a sort of pseudo-inflammatory response, probably from a robust immune infiltrate. And so this is a, a sign that good things are happening to the lesion, uh, even though there's a lot of hand wringing at this point. And then there's these lesions in group C that are big and bulky, and you think there's no way that radiosurgery is going to control this, and this patient really needs surgery, uh, but they're too sick systemically to undergo surgery because of their cancer. And so you give it radiosurgery as sort of a Hail Mary, and, and impressively the lesion regresses. And we're seeing more and more of this um, with fractionated strategies in a, in a mask-based setting on the new Gamma Knife uh, unit. And so lesions like this that were previously considered uh, surgery or bust really have more options now uh, for the patients and you can give them gamma knife over three to five fractions and, and get significant disease control such that they don't pass of their intracranial disease. Very nice, Toro, another nice summary as usual. Is it my understanding from your talk that every solitary met taken out now gets gamma knife? Yes, uh, postoperatively, yes. Yeah. That's considered standard of care. Yeah, interesting. And then when you target the, uh, with radiosurgery, a preoperative radiation, do you target the whole lesion or do you just target the margin? The whole lesion. Yeah. 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 And there's worry, about, there's worry about that, that if you target the whole lesion and it's big, that maybe you're gonna cause radiation necrosis. And, and that's why we wouldn't just treat those lesions with radiation alone. But it turns out that when you remove the lesion, you remove sort of the hot spots, And so there's not that same festering and risk of radiation necrosis. Yeah. Chris Taylor, you got your hand up with a question? 
Uh, Dr. Patel, I was curious about neoadjuvant treatment and how uh, dependent that is on a tissue diagnosis or whether you consider doing that without a tissue diagnosis? For all the neoadjuvant treatments I've done, they've always had a systemic tissue diagnosis, but never an intracranial one. Deciding which metastases to operate on, usually we talk about the big and symptomatic ones. Um, the one thing that fractionation changes or hypofractionation changes is the ability to radiosurgerize uh, some larger metastases that are asymptomatic. And what we found in our experience is we were using a linear accelerator, so we've been doing hypofractionation and maskless treatment for a while, um, is that a lot of these tumors that we used to say we have to operate on because they're too big for radiosurgery now could be managed uh, with radiation alone, but it's sort of a fine line that you need to walk uh, to figure out what to do. But um, I guess yeah. two, the, the large and symptomatic needs to be operated on, but the, the line where we need to operate on the large ones is probably shifting a little bit with hyperfractionation. Yes, I, I did mention that <laughs> earlier in the talk. Ah. No, but, but it's right. You know, the traditional teaching has been solitary brain met, large brain met, which was loosely defined as greater than two and a half centimeters or significant edema or symptomatic. Now, um, I, I think I use the words moving target, in fact, in my slide, but, but two and a half has become three and a half and now even four centimeters. And, and we really look at the volume more than just a single linear dimension. But with fractionation in the, in the icon, treating them in three or five fractions has, has really changed that line. And I would say, and I, I tell the residents that you really have to find a reason to operate on a brain metastasis these days because radiosurgery is quite effective for almost the entire cohort of disease. And so it's either there's so much edema and the oncologists need to get them on immunotherapies quickly. And so the fastest way to get rid of the edema is to surgically resect the lesion. That's a good reason. Or the patient's very symptomatic and not responsive to steroids and surgery is going to be better to reduce symptoms. Or there's so much mass effect, there's hydrocephalus, and you don't believe that fractionation can take care of that fast enough. And then one, one other comment, um, our field was very ahead of itself um, because we decided to define radiosurgery as any targeted radiation treatment in five or less fractions long before it was common to hypofractionate. So, uh, so radiosurgery formally is defined as five fractions or less. Um, and that's how the coding uh, so. hmm. Interesting. All right. So, had a question. Yes. So, so uh, you, you, you used, in your graph, you showed the obviously the place where the larger lesions needed the needed better options. Um, and there's this burgeoning field of you know in, of neurooncology from an interventional standpoint. We've talked about that a little bit. What are the, is there any? And I, just, I don't know. Is there any data or literature or you know, preliminary looks at any geographic characteristics of metastases. So if you, you think the larger metastases are typically going to be, you know, around longer, potentially have recruited, you know, a lot of times when we see them, they, they enhance more. Anything on that that might suggest that some of these might, you know, the whole, the whole thing about the inter interventional is obviously you know, getting catheters deeper and delivering chemotherapy directly, things like that. Is that you see where I'm going. Is there any talk, yeah. discussion about angiographic characteristics of metastases, and then and then where might that fit? Do you think in these larger lesions, which we're still trying to control? Yeah, that's a good question. I don't know any literature related to that, although I don't I don't know of anyone trying to do direct therapies towards nets yet yeah. uh, in that yeah. way. It's a good question. Yeah. All right. Well, thank you, Toral.